good afternoon uh, to one and all in the lisacon 2020 family a warm very warm welcome to the fourth day of uh, lisacon 2020 and the fifth technical session which focuses on the theme the role of libraries in inculcating research ethics in this session we have a plenary chair and six plenary speakers the session theme highlights the prime role of the library professionals to nurture and preserve a culture of healthy and best practices to be followed by the academic and research fraternity to foster academic integrity and research ethics, failing which we are only betraying ourselves. This is applicable for the researchers also. Librarians can take the leadership in spreading this message in the academia by offering a host of services and practice workshops etc. It's my pleasure to present before you the plenary chair, Dr. Partha Sarri Mukhapadhyay, Professor, Department of Library and Information Science, Kalyani University, Kolkata, a teacher par excellence, a technology savvy who not only develops cutting-edge software solutions for LIS applications using open source software, but also selflessly encourages his students and the world outside with a vast treasure of knowledge and experience. I, on behalf of the LIS Academy and the LISA Con 2020, extend to you a very warm welcome, Professor Parthasarvi Mukhapadhyay, for kindly accepting our invite to be the plenary chair for this session. Coming to the format of the session, the plenary chair will introduce the plenary speakers and will moderate the session and also question and answer session. I urge all the participants to make the best use of this unique and the best opportunity to update and enrich their knowledge. The best, attract, the best attraction of the conference is the KISS competition at the end of every day, every session. The link of the KISS section will be shared immediately after each of these sessions during Q&A session and the link will be active for 10 minutes. The participants will have to submit the answers within 10 minutes. The Winner will be announced in the beginning of the next session and will be published in LISACON 2020 website. The quiz session will be followed by publishers presentations. So friends, please welcome Dr. Parthasarvi Mukhopadhyay and over to you, Professor Parthasarvi. Thank you. Welcome to the National Virtual Conference on Reinventing Excellence in Librarianship, organized by LIS Academy. Uh, myself, uh, uh, Parthasarathi Mukhopadhyay, working in University of Kollani, Department of Library and Information Science in the capacity of a professor. I welcome you all uh, as a plenary chair of the Theme 5. The focus of Theme 5 is the uh, role of libraries in inculcating research ethics. And the topic of deliberation is uh, academic integrity. Can we get serious now? Now, the first question is that why library professionals need to know about academic integrity? The answer is quite simple. If you observe the uh, workflow of the uh, you know, academic libraries and special libraries in our country, in most of the cases, uh, the libraries have been entrusted uh, to uh, uh, with the task of plagiarism checking and different kind of research ethics. So we need to uh, learn uh, the ball game of academic integrity. We need to know that plagiarism is not the only facet of academic integrity. How are we are doing in our country and what are the future possibilities and ongoing changes in the domain of academic integrity. Academic honor code uh, is basically uh, developed by Don Maccabe, uh, you know, long back. He is considered as the grandfather of academic integrity. You can have a full article on uh, Don Maccabe uh, in, from Wikipedia. He emphasized that academic integrity is a value system that includes avoidance of cheating or plagiarism, maintenance of academic standards, honesty, and rigor in research and academic publishing. So basically, it's a value system and honor code. So let us have a look uh, before making a quantum jump in, in, in the in Indian situation. Let us take a look at what uh, other you know, universities in developing countries are doing. 
So here you can see in the screen that I have given a uh, uh, best practice guideline developed by International Standard Center for Academic Integrity that is called ICAI. Uh, the website address is academicintegrity.org. It was actually established way back in 1992 with the help of a, a, a group of North American universities alongside a few universities from Europe. So what they said in this best practice guideline, they said that entire academic integrity is based on the baseline of courage. Now on that particular baseline of courage, there are five pillars of academic integrity, honesty, trust, fairness, respect, and responsibility. So these are the five pillars of academic integrity and they have emphasized uh, you know, in their best practice guidelines how a university you know, can combat the situation uh, related to different facets of academic dishonesty. So this guidebook is completely uh, free and you can download it for your further knowledge. Before entering into the uh, Indian situation, we will be talking about, you know, uh, different, you know, activities taken by, uh, you know, different international communities related to academic integrity. Here you can see the spread of geographical spread of ICAI, International Center for Academic Integrity. It has wide presence with uh, membership, more than 200 plus universities. Many North American universities are part of this movement. A few European universities and Asian universities has also joined the movement. But till date, no university universities from India is actually a member of ICAI. We need to consider uh, this uh, for our universities. Now, let us look uh, that what the greatest academic institutes of the world are doing. So here you can see the Harvard College uh, Honor Council. So they prepared an honor council. And here, if you go through the uh, particular honor code created by Harvard University, you can find they are not in the process of terrorizing students and scholars. Rather, they wish to build uh, a value system inside the students and uh, learners related to different facets of academic integrity. And uh, from their guidebooks and guidelines, it is quite uh, clear that plagiarism is not the only factor related with the academic integrity. But in case of India, we are basically thinking academic integrity and plagiarisms or anti-plagiarisms are synonymous and we basically use these two terms interchangeably. That, but that should not be the case. Again, another university you see, uh, the Ivy League University, Stanford University, they have an office of the Community Standards uh, Student Affairs Office. They have prepared a detailed guideline, detailed honor code related to academic integrity. And only a few things are related with the plagiarism. And you can go through the things they have developed, the web, uh, website address I have given. So this is all about, uh, you know, Stanford University. Now let us check the situation, uh, what is happening in India, what is the situation in India related to academic integrity. Here in this particular area also, we wake up late, very late actually. You see ICAI was established in the year 1992, but UGC first came up with a regulation related to academic integrity only two years back in July 2018. Now, if we go through these six, uh, six, seven pages of regulation, we will find, you know, uh, interestingly, that uh, no other, you know, um, facets of academic integrity, uh, you know, uh, have been included only except only plagiarism. So what is the, uh, you know, uh, concept related to the section five of the regulation? In section five, UGC is actually advising all higher educational institute that they should conduct regular sensitizing seminars, awareness programs to build the you know, value system related to academic integrity. It should be part of the UG level courses and PG level uh, curricula. It should be part of the you know, uh, research course, uh, coursework. But only two points they have mentioned about plagiarism, uh, point number four and point number five. So of these six points, they have, uh, you know, uh, adv they have given advice on the basis of these six points, only two actually concerned with the, you know, plagiarism, rest of, uh, rest are actually uh, deal, uh, dealing with different kind of, you know, core structure related to academic integrity. But in universities of India, we actually overlook the first three points or the first three advices given by UGC and we only are emphasizing on uh, point number four and point number five. Because 
no universities no undergraduate courses no postgraduate courses in india still include research ethics in their curricula only two three classes we allot in in case of you know uh, research uh, coursework and uh, different kind of coursework related to phd program so ugc also advised that uh, each department each pg department should have departmental academic integrity at the institutional DIP level we should have iaip even this is not happening in indian universities most of the cases in pg department departmental research committees are actually taking the responsibility of daip and iqac at the institutional level uh, taking the responsibility of iaip but uh, ugc specially mentioned that these two you know uh, you know uh, organ or these two committees must be different from each other and they have also given the composition of this uh, you know particular uh, committees and you know um, uh, boards now if we go to the section 12 uh, of uh, this particular you know regulation given by ugc you see all about penalties there is no you know attempt to inculcate the values related to academic integrity inside this particular regulation they are only talking about the plagiarism and both related with the dissertation phd dissertation masters level dissertation and research publication and they have created four levels up to 10% uh, there is no penalty but beyond 10% you will be having you know uh, penalties from 10 to 14% some kind of punishment 40 to 60% and beyond 60% but you see again there is no research base that why cut off point is 10% nobody knows if 11% you are punishable if 9% or 10% you are free from any kind of penalty so this kind of you know cut off marks what is the basis where are the, what are the research data associated with this kind of cut off nobody knows simply these are the uh, things happening in in the name of academic integrity in india but we failed to understand largely that academic integrity is not all about plagiarism there are many facets so i'm i'm trying to prove my points that there are many facets beyond plagiarism in the domain of academic integrity now if we go to the in the next slide in the site number 11 if we go to the red trucks and watch database it's a global service which are basically collecting data related to papers and uh, you know different other research uh, you know uh, products uh, which have been retracted for different uh, reasons for different academic reasons so if you go through this particular uh, website retractionwatch.com you can find they have created user guidelines and in the user guidelines appendix b they have consolidated 90 plus reasons that can lead to retraction of a research paper and all these 90 plus reasons they have arranged alphabetically with proper description and other things now in the next slide right number 12 you can see that these are the alphabetical listing of all you know 90 plus uh, you know uh, reasons that are related to retractions of papers all over the world that only four factors uh, you know are actually related to the plagiarism plagiarism of article plagiarism of data plagiarism of image and plagiarism of text race 84 85 prisons are not actually related to plagiarism so what is happening as a whole our uh, indian researcher and students think that plagiarism is only you know a uh, uh, factor related to academic uh, integrity and all other factors we simply do not know we are not aware of it and simply we do not follow and that is giving a bad kind of results i am going to show you that what is happening because of this uh, lack of awareness related to different facets of academic integrity now uh, you know that retraction was uh, created a database also retraction database.org it is freely available anyone can utilize it and here you see we have given here a very simple kind of uh, search uh, criteria we have selected country as india all are you know earmarked with uh, red uh, circle then we have selected last 10 years 1st january 2010 to 31st december 2019 and we may, you know uh, perform the search query there so it will it retreat all the you know uh, retracted paper those are originated from india and you can see another red mark in the bottom part of the slide that 106 number of papers have so far been retracted which are actually originated from india during the last 10 years you can see that apart from all the search criteria we have taken earlier we have added an another such criteria that reasons for retraction related to only four factors of plagiarism that is plagiarism of article
article plagiarism of data plagiarism of image and plagiarism of text now here you see the result only 310 number of papers actually have been retracted due to plagiarism uh, out of 106 number of retracted paper so only around one third of the papers that have been published in india are retracted due to plagiarism and two third that is the majority of the papers uh, produced uh, in india are uh, have been retracted for different other reasons and our scholars simply do not know what are the other reasons that may lead to retraction of their research output so this is a you know a sorry state of affair as far as academic integrity uh, uh, you know india in india is concerned and as a library professional this is our role to you know uh, tell our user to make our users uh, aware our learners researcher aware about the availability of this kind of resources this kind of databases where they can check different possible errors and they can rectify themselves inside our research ethics program inside our uh, coursework related to phd program we simply do not teach this kind of availability of this kind of tools for the helpful uh, uh, for the you know uh, which can help our researcher uh, in a, to a great uh, extent now how this syntactic similarity based and anti plagiarism tools are doing whether they are performing their job properly or not that is actually our concern now here you can see that uh, the all plagiarism software are basically take the file break the text into uh, semantically related sentences and phrases then check uh, you know pattern and similarity by following an algorithm which is called single alg single algorithm and this algorithm is actually meant uh, to uniquely identify a, 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 a string of text now here lies the problem because of this you know syntactic uh, similarity based anti plagiarism tools are not performing their job properly now you can see here i have gathered uh, the top uh, 10 anti plagiarism software in the world and uh, uh, from this top 10 we can again uh, reclassify or regroup the four mostly used uh, you know anti plagiarism software turn it in with the you know highest user base 30 million and followed by urkun plagscan and unicheck so i am taking here turn it in as a representative as it is the topmost you know anti plagiarism software i am taking turn it in as a representative of the array of anti plagiarism software okay so let us check uh, what the research says and how they are doing in the slide number 18 you can see that uh, how uh, financially uh, well of these companies are this alternative uh, established in the year 1998 and basically they have you know um, uh, reached up to, uh, to a level in uh, so that in 2019 they procured a, a company advanced publication at the cost of 1.75 billion Mostly, uh, the Tarnitin uh, makes uh, annual review, uh, average annual review, 127 millions. But you see here in the bottom part of the slide number 19, that Joseph Thomas once said that there is a serious problem and it is too much to expect a commercial company like Tarnitin is actually quite serious in adhering the values related to academic, you know, uh, honesty, academic integrity. So it is too much to expect from a commercial uh, company like Tarnitin because plagiarism is their bread and butter and they are actually living on the top of plagiarism. So they are not quite, uh, they are not quite serious to reduce the level of plagiarism in uh, you know, different academic activities. So if you go to the insidehireed.com, it's a beautiful you know, website, uh, you know, produce different kind of uh, reports related to the performance of different anti-plagiarism software. Here you see one particular you know, experiment I am citing here. Uh, one experiment took 23 plagiarized school, school essays and compared the uh, you know, relative performance of three tools, turn it in safe assigned and Google. So here you see, uh, you know, in nine cases, Tarnitin felt out of 23. In 13 cases, safe assigned felt out of 23. But Google, simple Google search actually, you know, uh, came with the flying color and it failed only in two cases out of 23. So Google, simple Google search is performing better than the million dollar tool uh, like Tarnitin. Now, another research work from the same website, insidehireed.com, 
it shows it took uh, a large sample 37 school essays plagiarized school essays and it checked on it in that it uh, found only 40 40 percent of the plagiarism partially found plagiarism in 16 percent of the document and failed or not found any plagiarism although these are heavily plagiarized in case of 45 4 percent cases so 44 percent cases started it failed to detect plagiarism for which we pay millions of dollars every year to the company we conducted a very simple you know um, um, uh, experiment we took a particular uh, you know uh, research uh, two paragraphs on a research article available from ala tech source uh, chapter one on web scale discovery written by john Bagan. So these two paragraphs, we now uh, came to Google Translate and translated that particular English text into Bengali. So in the next slide, in the slide number 23, you can see we have taken the input of the translated Bengali text and retranslated that one into English. And finally, uh, utilize Grammarly apps to correct the different kind of grammatical error produced in the Google translation and sent it to Urkun for checking similarity. Urkun finds similarity, but only 5%, but and failed to detect the source article. So we first take the English uh, you know, text, convert it into Bengali, then took the Bengali, converted Bengali text, retranslated into English, and Urkun failed to find the sources. And this may happen with different other, you know, um, anti-plagiarism tools. So this, that's why calls uh, Storm CM one site uh, that we are paying instructor list, but we find money to pay these policing tools that actually does not work. And another uh, article published in Nature by Deborah Weber Wolf in the bottom part of the slide number 24, you can see that plagiarism detectors are a crash and a problem. So these are not actually working as expected against uh, our huge payment also. And uh, this is the situation. But the question is why they are failing? Because they most of the anti-plagiarism tools solely depend on the uh, you know syntactic similarity they do not take uh, into consideration the semantic similarity so if you you know considerably rephrase a particular paragraph or a, or, or a sentence so it fails to find out so there lies the scope of the semantic similarity semantic similarity are actually based on the two vector one is called the order vector based on the syntactic similarity another is called semantics uh, you know vector which is based on the semantic similarity and you see here there is a free tool called dandelion.eu so if you you know use this particular tool you can check here you see we did another ex experiment here we took a you know uh, phrase uh, related to international cooperation in the slide number 26 you can see that uh, you know we refreshed in a uh, you know completely in a different way but the meaning is the same actually and syntactical similarity reduced to zero percent you can see and still semantic similarity shows it is 66 percent plagiarism so this kind of you know semantic similarity they don't take into consideration that is one of the problem so another example i have given uh, for the similarity checking uh, from the library science domain so the first uh, you know in the uh, upper part of the slide number 27 you can see the original text that is a uh, that is actually rewritten and refreshed in in, a, uh, in, a, in the next sentences and these two sentences will match for the similarity and here you see Although I replace this particular sentences, but the meaning is the same syntactic similarity. I managed to uh, keep within the permissible limit that is 9% only less than 10%, but semantic similarity is still significantly higher. So these are the point of consideration. They don't take, take into, uh, you know, uh, per view. Another important, uh, you know, issues related with the semantic similarity, you can see from the slide number 28, they can raise different kind of false alarm. So what is the false alarm? So here I am giving you one example. I have taken one sentence, James Cameron, who is basically the director of the very popular movie Titan, wins the Oscar in best directory category. And in the same year, David Cameron, another completely different person who was ex-PM of UK, wins general election in UK. Now here you see, here falsely or uh, you know <clears throat> misappropriately syntactic similarity goes up to 42 percent but still you see semantic similarity is less than 10 percent means that not this uh, syntactic similarity based anti-plagiarism tools may raise uh, you know false alarm in different cases two sentences are completely different from each other still they show uh, they are actually related with each other so this kind of problems are associated with syntactic similarity based anti-plagiarism tools
So one research work I would uh, like to refer uh, here, uh, this research work performed by Kevin Walchuk from the University of Ontario. So he raised a very interesting question, three research question. I would like to give you the emphasis on the third question, third research question in slide number 30, that is turn it, uh, turn it in able to detect plagiarist ideas and content in written submission. And you see what he answered actually at the end of his research. He said categorically that all this kind of, you know, anti-plagiarism tools based on cement, uh, syntactic similarity actually fails for the older materials. So if I plagiarize some documents from document published in 1970 and beyond, then Tarnitin or other related software will fail to recognize it. And if you come to the bottom part of this, uh, this particular slide, what he answered against the course research question number three, that uh, Tarnitin or any other anti-plagiarism software was unable to indicate whether textual submission was similar from a semantic perspective or not identifying more advanced and difficult forms of plagiarism were beyond the software's capability and scope of the design. That means they are not in a position to check semantic similarity or idea plagiarism. They only go for the text plagiarism. Now, apart from semantic similarity, another new kind of, you know, uh, development is ongoing in our, uh, the domain of academic integrity. So the 2019, this is actually called the AI uh, for text generation. In 2019, this is considered as the best year of AI text generation. Uh, different companies came up with different language models. Google came with BRT model. OpenAI came with the GPT-2 model. Alan L NLP came with Elmo and J Howard came with ULM FIT. So amongst uh, these four models, actually GPT-2 or GPT-3 developed by OpenAI own the battle of AI text generation. In 2020, two months back in June 2020, actually GPT-3 came, uh, came up, uh, actually developed by OpenAI. And it's a gigantic model language model in compare with the GPT-2 and you see what it can do but before that you need to have an idea that what is this ai text generation so these are there here in the slide number 33 i have given a screen set of uh, mobile text prediction you can you are all habituated with it then the text prediction or a few word prediction uh, performed by word processing software and finally you see in the bottom part of the slide how gmail actually imp implemented brt model and now can predict a few words when you are writing your email so gpt2 or gpt3 is actually working in the same uh, fashion but much more advanced level it can predict a sentence if you give a paragraph or gpt3 if you give a sentence it can predict a paragraph so this is called ai text generation and you can see uh, in your own eyes gpt3 came as i said in uh, 2000 uh, you know um, 20 uh, june 2020 uh, actually uh, it is different from the GPT-2 in the sense GPT-2 came up with only 1.5 billion parameters, but GPT-3 includes 175 billion parameters and is considered as a giant in compare with GPT-2 as revealed in slide number 36. Here you see what GPT-3 can do. It can write a software code, it can write SQL parameter, and it can go for different kind of creative writing, short stories, poem, including scientific writing. So let us go for an experiment. What GPT-3 and GPT-2 can uh, uh, you know, uh, do so that you can have an idea that where this academic you know, uh, plagiarism, AI text generation can affect you know, the plagiarism business of different kind of anti-plagiarism tool. So here in the slide number 37, you see I have taken, a, I have written myself a sample paragraph related to library discovery and a sample head, uh, you know, a clue or a line uh, well, first one meant for GPT-2 and the next one meant for GPT-3. Now let us go for uh, some kind of experiment with GPT-2 based tools. So here you see I have taken a tool, uh, GPT-2 tool, uh, two tool and here you see the paragraph I have pasted there and simply pressed at, uh, or triggered the auto generation of text through the tab command and it can generate a full grammatically correct contextualized sentence. I have given a paragraph, it can generate a sentence. Now at the end of the AI written paragraph, if I again press a tab, it, uh, tab, it will give me you know, a few suggestions that what should be the next sentence. I can pick up the 
value and I can go on uh, writing my paragraph in this particular fashion. So what are the anti plagiarism tools and uh, this is another you know experiment with GPT tool another tool is there I have given a paragraph it produced a, a paragraph. So this kind of advancement is happening but the question is that what are the different kind of you know uh, anti plagiarism tools are uh, doing to combat this uh, you know um, uh, this kind of AI text generation. So Tarnitin came up recently with a program called authorship checking. It can automatically check whether a particular piece of writing is uh, from a particular author or not. And Unicheck came with an uh, intelligent program called EMA, which basically can detect whether a piece of writing is from a particular author or not. But these two model has got serious problem and serious limitation in one aspect that we need to fit lot many writings to you know to the computer system to indicate the writing style of a particular person and then only it can detect against a uh, newly given paragraph whether this paragraph is written by that person or not so with ai detection that may not be practical and it is failing this is actually related to gpt3 as i said you uh, that it is a much more improvement in compare with the gpt2 uh, so here you see in the lead part i have given uh, in the slide number 43 in the upper part i have given uh, a clue a sentence library discovery system and so on it can generate a related contextually paragraph on the basis of that lead sentence so that is the advancement and what syntactic anti plagiarism can uh, deal with because these are not detectable by any anti plagiarism software every time they will uh, produce newly you know contextualized uh, contextualized text those are not part of any of the databases and any of the system and so fairly the anti plagiarism to, uh, tools in including Google search will fail to detect the origin of the source. This is called the AI generation of textual materials. Uh, some of the, you know, some of the, some persons came up with a very intelligent, you know, approach. They are using AI to stop AI writing. So one of the person and uh, Giulio Steras came up with a new approach to detect AI from uh, uh, by utilizing AI based programming. So it's a, um, amazingly, it's a very simple and available uh, free of cost as a Google Chrome pl uh, plugin. You can download from the Chrome web store, you can install in your Google Chrome and you can check whether a uh, given text is AI generated, machine generated or human generated. So let us go for another sets of experiment. So here you see, you can remember we created one particular uh, paragraph. First part is written by me, human generated, and the second part is written by the machine, machine generated or AI generated text, which is basically in slide number 46, you can see the machine generated part of this particular paragraph with light blue background. Now, what I, uh, uh, three experiment uh, I did so far for this particular deliberation. First, I selected the entire paragraph. So it's a mixture of human generated text and AI generated text. Then I call GP2 or false from my Chrome uh, you know, uh, plugin and uh, extension. Then if I click the evaluate button here, you see it gives me a caution that according to the detector, there is a 1.45% chance that the uh, selected text written by a human. So it is, you know, uh, no, uh, correctly speaking, that this is not actually wholly human generated. It's a mix up of AI generated and human generated text, and it gave me a red border related to that. Now, let us select only the human generated part, that is the part written by me, and check whether GPT-2 can check and point it out correctly or not. So another type, I have selected only that you know uh, uh, part produced by me. I call GPT-2 and here you can see in the slide number 50, it says that 88.68% chance is that, that this particular selected is written by a human. Now in the next uh, experiment, I have selected only that part which generated by AI and here you see GPT-2 says that it is there is only 0.02% chance that this selected text is written by a human. So it is working very finely and free of cost and this way we can detect AI with the help of AI. So the ball game is quite changing from syntactic uh, similarity based anti plagiarism tools. We, are, we have entered into the era of AI generation text where AI is actually detecting AI generated text. Now, do you think that now that syntactic similarity based anti plagiarism tools are outdated model? Yes, this has uh, these have already been outdated and uh, sooner we know it, uh, it, uh, it is better.
but don't think that it's a disaster rather i think it's an opportunity why i am thinking so because instead of penalizing penalizing students for using ai tools like gpt2 and gpt3 experts suggest that we should use them as teachable moments and here lies the great role of teachers and library professionals we can teach them how to use uh, this particular you know research support system intelligently because using gpt2 or gpt3 requires a students or researcher to know enough about the material to determine whether the output is appropriate or applicable if we if i put a starter uh, statement in gpt2 as you have seen that it again uh, you know uh, takes several attempts to get back the proper you know uh, contextualized sentence which is actually fitting with you know my objective of writing so the key learning opportunity related to gpt2 and gpt3 is that it triggers the skill that researcher need to be focusing on and library professional read, uh, needs to promote information acquisition and assessment so thank you that's all of